When you think of the word epiphany, what comes to mind? And I don't necessarily mean what comes to mind in the context of the church year, although we'll get to that in a bit. I mean, more generally, when you hear that someone has had an epiphany, what comes to mind? I know that when I think about what an epiphany is or even feels like, it's basically a moment in time where all of a sudden the world makes sense in a way that it didn't before. Now, sometimes this is because I learn a new piece of information about something, or other times it's that someone explains something to me in a new way. Or other times it's even that I manage to finally connect a couple of dots in my own head that connects things in a new way for me. Whatever the cause of that specific epiphany, what makes an epiphany significant is that it unlocks a bunch of other things. It's that moment that places everything else in context and explains why the world works in the way that it does. There are moments that not only give new insight, but also that completely reorder how you understand the world. And often, those epiphanies not only change how you see the world, but they also mean, well, that you kind of have to live differently than you were before. The biggest epiphanies in my life made it so obvious that I had to live and act in a different way than I had been. One of the other interesting things to me is that, yeah, many times we think of an epiphany as a good thing, as something to be welcomed. But the reality is sometimes people do actually resist an epiphany and they don't really want them to happen. Usually this is in situations where someone is benefiting from the way that things currently are working and they would like to keep the truth hidden. They don't generally want other people to have the epiphany, to see what's really going on, because then, well, then they would lose power or wealth or control or whatever it is. Epiphanies are both liberating, but also very dangerous to certain people. Now, all of this makes a lot more sense when we learn what the word epiphany actually means. The word epiphany means the revealing or to reveal. It's the idea that something was hidden or kept secret and then the truth was revealed to you, which makes a lot of sense for how we use the word epiphany in common usage. Something important that was hidden or secret from us is revealed and the truth now changes how we understand the world. Knowing that epiphany means the revealing also helps explain the Christian season of Epiphany as well. Some of us might know Epiphany as a particular date on the calendar that happens 12 days after Christmas. And we might know that on Epiphany we celebrate the wise men or the magi coming to visit Jesus. But what we might not know is why exactly the Magi are associated with Epiphany. The full title of this holiday is actually The Epiphany of the Good News to the Gentiles, or more clearly put, it is the revealing of the good news to the Gentiles. It's the celebration of the message of Jesus expanding beyond the Hebrew people. And for the first couple hundred years or so, the Magi, well, they weren't really even connected to this holiday. The reason that they became connected with Epiphany is that they are the first non-Jewish people in the Bible to worship Jesus. They're the first Gentiles to experience the good news of Jesus. The other important thing to note about Epiphany is that, that it isn't really just a single day. It's more of a whole season. The church calendar has different seasons that help us to celebrate different parts of the story of the Bible. Advent and Christmas help us to celebrate the incarnation and the birth of Jesus. Lent and Easter help us celebrate his death and resurrection. Pentecost helps us celebrate God sending the Holy Spirit as our guide. Between Christmas and Lent, however, there is this other season, which is the season of Epiphany. And in this period of time, there are a whole set of scriptures that center around the life, teaching, and working of Jesus. 
The themes for these weeks revolve around stories of the true nature of Jesus being revealed to the people in the gospel stories, and by extension being revealed to us as well. In some form or another, it's a season where we come to Jesus with one set of expectations, but we find out that this guy, Jesus, he is something far more powerful and amazing than we first thought. These stories include Jesus announcing what his work and ministry is, really is about, and then flipping everyone's assumptions upside down completely. There are also stories, not just of Jesus doing miracles and healing people, but doing them in ways that show that he is not just your run-of-the-mill miracle worker, but he is something even more powerful than that. And then today, as we come to the end of Epiphany, we find a couple of scriptures that point to Jesus as the source and example of divine wisdom. But they also tell us that that wisdom is not like what we might expect and is not necessarily welcomed by everyone. The Apostle Paul in the letter to the Corinthians really brings this difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom into the forefront in an interesting kind of way. Paul is writing to the people in the city of Corinth which was an economic hub of the Roman Empire. In Greek and Roman culture, there was a strong culture of philosophy. The Greek word for wisdom is sophia, which means that philosophy comes from the words to love, philo, and sophia, for wisdom. Now, there were a bunch of different schools of philosophers, even, even a group called the Sophists, which is an interesting name in and of itself. Now, remember here, that this is long before television or movies or the internet, and so they needed other ways of entertaining themselves. And one of the more popular things to do was to have these different philosophers put on these public, public performances or debates. They would often give these speeches, often talking about how awesome they were or powerful they were or how smart they were. Basically, how they were better than the other speaker that was on the stage with them. The whole point was to impress the people listening by making yourself look better than the other guy. Now, when Paul talks about bringing his message without using persuasive or wise words, he's likely referring to this kind of speaking. What's interesting is that in this letter, Paul essentially takes the form of some of those speeches and turns them on their head. Instead of achievements and power, he talks about weakness, and humility. And in, most importantly, when talking about Jesus, he says that he proclaims Christ crucified, which really is something that would have been completely upside down for the people hearing it. I mean, they knew what a Christ, a Messiah, a Savior was, and what a Christ was supposed to be. And being crucified was not part of that description. Being crucified means you lost. There is no such thing as a Christ crucified because the definition of a Christ does not means that they did not lose. As Paul talks about later in scripture, the kind of wisdom that God was revealing through Jesus is so completely different than the conventional wisdom of the day that many people simply would not have been able to get their minds around it. However, this is completely in line with what Jesus knew and experienced for himself firsthand, repeatedly in the Gospel story. In this story from the Gospel of Luke, we see Jesus saying point blank to the crowd listening to him that he and John the Baptist are messengers who reveal God's wisdom, that that wisdom isn't like the wisdom they're used to, and that a lot of people didn't like either one of them, and that they are rejecting both John and Jesus. Now, there's a couple of interesting things to note here to help us understand what's going on. For starters, the last sentence in this scripture is, yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. Wisdom, in both Hebrew and Greek, is personified as a woman. It's a female image. 
Which is interesting because Jesus is also clearly talking not about conventional wisdom, but about divine wisdom, which makes this a very feminine image of God. Which is also interesting because Jesus is ultimately referring to himself and anyone who follows him as children of that divine Sophia, that divine wisdom. And in the Bible, to be a child of something or someone is a way of saying that you are taking on the traits of that person, of that thing. You are acting like that person or being. Jesus being a child of that divine Sophia wisdom is a way of saying that Jesus is God's wisdom in the flesh. Which is important when we also hear what he's just said about the people rejecting both John's path towards God's wisdom and his path to God's wisdom. Jesus compares how people have rejected both John and Jesus to kids playing in the marketplace. Now that whole thing about playing a flute and not dancing and wailing but not weeping, that's a reference to games that kids would play. Just like the play of children today mimics what they see adults doing, so did the games back then. Two of the common games were basically play versions of weddings and funerals, which were big parts of life. And so basically Jesus is saying to this crowd that he and John are like kids inviting others to play with them, but everyone else wants to go off and do something else. Jesus says that John came to them and offered them this path to God that involved involved abstaining from the pleasures of life, singing a mournful tune, if you will. And the people rejected him, saying that he was out of his mind. But then Jesus comes singing this joyous tune, offering an invitation to all people to join God's table through grace and celebration, and they found something wrong with that too, and still refused to join in. Jesus is frustrated because it seems like no matter what he does, he just can't win. Jesus is clearly frustrated with the crowds who are listening to him. And at the end of airing that frustra frustration, he basically says, yeah, well, so go off and do what you want. But, you know, we'll see who's right in the end. God's wisdom will win out. You'll see. Jesus knows who he is. And that even though people are rejecting him, he's still on the right path, doing the right things. As we bring the epiphany season to a close, what is it that we are supposed to take away from these stories today, and really the whole season? If the scriptures we've had in the last two months have been revealing who Jesus really is and what Jesus is really doing, we might ask, what is it that is being revealed to us through these scriptures? Well, I think there are two main things that are being revealed. The first of which is that Jesus, Jesus is not just a prophet. He's not just a teacher. He's not just a miracle worker. Jesus is the full presence of God made real in human flesh. He is the wisdom of God incarnate, which means that if you want to understand what God wants, what God thinks, what God cares about, not only what the wisdom of God is, but what it looks like to actually live that wisdom out on a day-to-day -day basis, if you want to know all of that, all you have to do is look at Jesus. He is the revealer of all of that stuff to the world. The second thing is that we should also not be surprised when other people don't understand it or are confused by it or even are threatened by it and reject it. The wisdom of Jesus really is an epiphany, a revelation that causes us to understand the whole world in a completely different way. And while many of us welcome that, that revealing of how God's world works is also threatening to a whole lot of other people as well. Next week, we are moving into the season of Lent, which is what leads us up to Easter. The theme for this year is Seeking God's Ways and is based off of Isaiah 55, verse 8, 
which says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. If Epiphany shows us that God's wisdom revealed in Jesus is different than what we might first think of as wisdom, well then the coming weeks will help us dive deeper into understanding what that path, what that way of God really looks like. And so today, as we draw this season to a close, my prayer for all of us is that we might have our own epiphany, that the wisdom of God might be revealed to each one of us, and that we might see the world not through our eyes, but through the eyes of God. Amen.